Good to see you. If you're new here today, especially if you're joining us on video at Racecourse or Hove or uh, at Shoreham, we are uh, looking at a part of the Bible uh, in the, the beginning of the New Testament, the book of Matthew and chapter 16. It says this, And the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. And he answered them, when it's evening, you say, it'll be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it'll be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky. but You cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. When the disciples reached the other side, they'd forgotten to bring any bread. And Jesus said to them, watch and beware the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they began discussing it among themselves, saying, we brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive, do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered or the, the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Perhaps you know what it feels like to be under scrutiny, to be constantly sensing that you're being watched and tested. Uh, you feel this particularly perhaps when you're in a new employment situation, uh, you're being compared to the previous person who was uh, carrying the job before you. Perhaps you felt this in a relationship. How do I measure, is, is she or is he pleased with me? Do they like me? What do they think? You, you feel like you're being watched. Maybe you've adopted children and you feel like you're having to be careful because every decision you make, every word you say is being scrutinized. And uh, that's, a, that's a common experience in life, the feeling of being watched and tested. Uh, it can certainly force within us uh, an instinct of performance. We can start to try, in a sense, to uh, so perform that we end up not really being able to sustain it because we're sort of operating outside of who we truly are. We just can't be ourselves because we're trying to fit into somebody's grid of anticipation so, so hard. And it's interesting to see, given that common experience, how Jesus handles it when people are putting him on test, on trial as it were and wanting to scrutinize him and watch him and see how he performs. That's uh, what seems to happen throughout the stories in the Gospels. In many places, people look at his life, look at his conduct, look at the, the extraordinary things he does and listen to the teaching, and they make a very positive evaluation. I mean, even just what we looked at last week in chapter 15 and verse 31, it says that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. That's a positive evaluation. Worship. They just lost in wonder. They, they wondered. They are astounded at how good he seems to be. But of course, that's, that's one segment of society. It may be a very big one. It may be the crowd. But here we get really the leaders of the society, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the influencers, the power brokers, the, the upstream people, if you like. And right here, we see their attitude laid bare. Because as it says in verse 1, the Pharisees and the Sadducees came and to test him, they asked him, to show them a sign from heaven, to test him. Their, their attitude is scrutiny. When people test God, or even tempt God. What they're doing is they're trying to say, you prove yourself to me. You, you show yourself, you come down to my level and meet my needs and then I'll respect you. And they're kind of 
presenting themselves in the position of center of the universe and making God their servant. They're testing him, they're tempting him, as it were, trying to make him feel uh, somehow insecure, as though God can be manipulated and bullied and given emotional blackmail. Oh, really, I, I ought to perform now. They need a test from me. And Jesus, it seems, is not manipulated by this. He's not easily bullied. He's not easily forced into a corner. You'll notice this as you go through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You look at Jesus' behavior and the way he conducts conversations because what he does is he turns it back on the questioner and asks a question in response. And there's certainly a lesson for us to learn there. We don't have to feel obliged to answer every question in the way in which it's asked. We don't have to. Not always. Some, there are times when we can say, I don't have to answer that. There are times when we can say, no, no let me ask you a question. In response, and Jesus certainly seems to do that kind of thing throughout the Gospels. And in this story, he shows his unwillingness to come under their scrutiny, their squashing, uh, pressurizing, bullying manipulation. In instead, he responds in, in three particular ways. I want to outline this in these three ways uh, before we finish this message. That the first of them is that he sees through the skepticism. He sees right to the heart. He sees what's underneath the question. Every question that comes to you will have a question behind it, will have a, a set of assumptions behind it, a set of presuppositions. Sometimes people don't realize they have these presuppositions. They don't even know what they're assuming when they ask the question. But you can, if you're wise, start to look underneath the surface and think, now the reason you're asking me this is because of some things that you've assumed. Jesus definitely sees through their question. You can see how he sort of summarizes it with his kind of folk tale kind of language in, in uh, verse 3, end of verse 3. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you can't interpret the signs of the times. He say, look, you guys, you, you, you think you're so wise, you're so scientific, you know how to understand things that are pretty obvious. You know, they're kind of, they're just plainly, blankly obvious. When, when it's red sky at night, shepherd's delight. And he doesn't use quite that language, but that's the Anglo-Saxon version of it. Red sky at night, shepherd's delight. Red sky at morning, shepherd's warning. You know, minced lamb and mashed potato, shepherd's pie. Uh, the kind of, that, that part isn't part of it, just so you know, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. But Jesus kind of uh, is using, drawing on folk understanding of nature all right he's saying you guys you know you can test the you know it's going to rain you know it's you know you're pretty good at forecasting not as good as we are in the 21st century but they, they knew their thing or two he's saying how is it that you're so good at that kind of knowledge but you're so poor at this kind of spiritual knowledge can't you see isn't it obvious from the things i've done the miracles the teaching it's very obvious that I don't, in a sense, need to be tested by you. If you've hung around for more than 24 hours, and these probably had, they'd heard the stories, they'd watched for long enough, they should have known, but it seems that their, their analysis of Jesus is biased. They're believing what they want to believe. They're listening to what they want to listen to. And they're making judgments, they think, on the basis of very cold, rational, evidence-based analysis. But really, they, they should know better. They should know that they're biased. They don't really want Jesus. They don't like Jesus. They don't trust Jesus. They don't like the look of Jesus. They feel threatened by Jesus. And so they're saying, uh, we'd like to test you. We'd like to really try out whether you really come from God, whether you really are who you say you are. And this is an instinct that we share with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That's why I made this point on the, the PowerPoint to say he sees our skepticism, not just theirs. It's not just their problem. Friends, it's in every human being. This tendency to analyze the things that are going on and not quite realize how biased we're being and how much our evaluation, our yeah or no, is based on what we would personally prefer to be the truth. We might even pretend that we're doing it on the basis of careful scientific study. Uh, be careful. When it comes to the things of God, we, we can throw the facts out the window pretty quick. Because God's threatening. God's awkward. God's inconvenient. God never shows up without ruining something. And so we need to be really careful really humble 
And read carefully, look carefully, look, look with an open heart, with a humble attitude. And certainly that is not on display here. It's fascinating to me that in the same story or, or a similar story in John's gospel, this is after the feeding of the 4,000. In John's gospel, he's reporting on the one that happened before, the feeding of the 5,000, even more spectacular, it would seem. It's literally just after that, in his account of this, that some of the people come to Jesus and they say to him in chapter 6 of John's Gospel, verse 30, 31, they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now, these are Jewish people who knew their Bibles. They knew the background of Israel. God had miraculously fed his people in the desert with spiritual heavenly bread. It's in the book of Exodus. You can read it. It's fascinating. It's extraordinary. It's one of those miracles of the Bible that you think, wow, if that happened, that is amazing. It shows God was with his people and God was with Moses, the leader of the people. God was with Moses because he fed them heavenly bread. Now, these people, they've literally, it seems, just sort of got up from the banquet they've had on the hillside where they've eaten heavenly bread and fish that Jesus provided from one kid's packed lunch. Jesus has just given them so much bread that it says they were all satisfied. There were 12 baskets left over. So these guys are still kind of picking breadcrumbs out of their beards. And in the same breath saying to Jesus, um, Moses provided bread from heaven. Now what sign will you do? What? What is going on with these people? I can imagine just... Uh, uh, I, I just did that. Did you, you, you're eating it. It's in your tummy. This bread is, I just did that one. And these guys think, well, you know, when you know the Bible like we do, <laughs> you'll know that Moses, he, he, can you do this? I wonder if you could bring some bread from heaven. It's just bizarre how the mind seems to work in this way that we, God can be doing something that's demonstrable, that's clear, that's remarkable, and yet our minds refuse to receive it. We, we're bent in a certain twisted way. Jesus actually gives a, a verdict about this in John chapter 3, just a few pages before that, where he's speaking to, to Nicodemus, and he says, this is the judgment, the light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. So we, we have a tendency to think, well, if only the light would come, if only God would come, if only some grace would come into my life, if, if only God would just turn up in my life and help me and change things and make my life better and do the things that I really think he ought to do. If only he would sort that problem out and this problem, if only he would show up and solve all the problems, if only light would come. And Jesus said the people don't really like the light. It's not the problem of whether God's shown up or given evidence or proved himself. That's not really necessarily the issue. Jesus says, ah, the verdict is, and he's allowed to give a verdict. He's got some credibility, I think you'd agree. He says, the verdict is this. The whole world doesn't really like the light. He says, reason why is because our works are evil. So it goes on in verse 20. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light. doesn't come to the light lest his works should be exposed. Why are we biased? Because our works are evil. God doesn't put up with darkness. You want to get near to God, you usually go through a process of feeling a little uncomfortable. There's darkness in here. There's selfishness. There's greed. There's lust. There's laziness. There's gluttony. There's, there's bitterness and unforgiveness. There's all of these things, and, and they're, they're in here. There's a cauldron of things that are always swirling around. We shouldn't be expecting or assuming that coming to the light of the world will just be a picnic in the park. No, 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 this is going to be awkward and uncomfortable. In fact, it'll be so uncomfortable to come to the real God that we will do our damnness to avoid him. We will, we will even avoid him while we're pretending to come to him. We'll come to him in a certain way, on our terms. And we'll say, don't go there, Jesus. Don't go there. You're not touching that part of my life. But I'll come to church but don't you dare touch that part of my life. Because we're hiding from him. We're worried about him. We're uncomfortable, naturally, left to ourselves. This is the condition of the human heart. And it does us good to see it in the Bible, to talk about it, and to be humble, to keep our hearts on guard, to watch ourselves, to think, is there any of that in me? Is there any of that tendency 
in my style, in the way I make decisions? Am I a little biased? Do I need help? Do I need to be careful just trusting my own instincts on every issue? I've noticed this when I, you know, just illustrations of it. You think about air pilots, how they, they have to go through a process of learning to trust the instruments in the cockpit. They, they're, taught, they're taught, you don't just trust your instincts, because a pilot might think, well, we're not descending. You know, there's heavy mist or there's not very good visibility for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, I know, I can feel whether we're ascending or descending. I know our altitude. I know the conditions. I know. I've driven a car. I know how to do this thing. And they're taught, no, 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 you don't do that. <laughs> you don't do that. You trust the instruments. Don't just go with your instincts because your instincts can be false. So what we need is an authority. What we need is revelation. What we need is for God to show up and teach us and show us and help us away from our blindness. We really do need that. We need that for some obvious reasons. Just think about things like morality. We're very keen to make moral judgments, right? That's kind of part of being human as well. We're very keen on saying, well, that behavior is disgraceful. And this behavior is acceptable. That's wrong, that's right. And I'm the judge because I'm on Twitter. So I get to say, and I've heard that thousands of other people are against this, so I ought to be quickly as well, just to show my credentials, show that I'm in the right position on this issue. We're very good at that. We're very good at, you know, people get on radio, people get on TV, people are very good at declaiming things and, and affirming things and getting a round of applause on question time because, well, I said the right thing. I said the fashionable thing. I said the thing that's acceptable in my society. The problem with that is that the acceptable thing in society is going to change in about 20 years. It always does. You know that. The things that we thought were acceptable in the 70s, many of the things that people would have seen not as normal behavior, nowadays we see them as unthinkable. Things that your grandparents thought as just given. Everyone agrees on this issue. These days you think, how could, it's disgusting. Anyone who thinks that is beyond the pale. And so we have very high moral standards, but we base them on the changing of the tides. We base them effectively on the same thing as what we base, you know, what width trousers we should wear. It's fashion. It's what it is. It's what's fashionable. The opinions are the fashionable ones. That's a little scary, I think you'll agree. Because the fashionable opinions in Germany in the 1930s were not good. But they were fashionable. They were acceptable. They became normal. They became public. They prevailed. If the Nazis had won the war, we would have all agreed with them eventually. That's the way that society goes. We go with, oh, this is, the, this is the way it's going, is it? If we just say, well, this, is, this seems right to us, this seems right, oh, that, that's, oh, no, we've grown up, we're enlightened since then. I think we're still playing a very subjective game. We might find, or we might be too dead to find, but our great-grandchildren might look back on the things we assumed in the 21st century in Brighton, early 21st century, and think, how could they believe such things? And we think it's normal. Friends, we, we are definitely, definitely lost at sea if we think that we can base our morality on just our favorite opinion or just our personal sense of instinct, our evaluation. We do need help. We need authority. We need revelation. We need someone to come down and say, here is truth. Here's what God says. Here's heavenly standards. And Jesus turns up to do just that, to give us answers, to take away our cataracts so we can see. And that's precisely what he seems to be doing as he goes on, and I want to show he's not just going to uh, point out the skepticism or, or see through it. He's going to point to the danger when he gets the 12 on their own. So it gets to verse 6, where he, he's speaking to them. Oh, verse 5, but I'll read on from 6. As Jesus said to them, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So this is like a team huddle. Okay, time out. We're, we're, we're aside now. We're on the other side of the lake. Just us now, Jesus and the 12. Guys, okay, were you listening? Okay, there was the big crowd, lots of uh, bread <laughs> and fish, miracle, lots of healings, lots of extraordinary miracles. God showed up in a powerful way. Did you see that? And then did you see those guys, those leaders, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they showed up and they poured scorn on it. They, made, they, 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 they asked me to prove myself in spite of everything. Now, I want you to look at this. I want you to learn the lesson, guys. I want you 12 to not be like those gentlemen. I want you to have a different attitude to those Sadducees and Pharisees. That's what he's saying here. He's warning them against the leaven, as he calls it, of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The leaven, which we, I guess we would normally see as yeast. It's basically yeast. It's, it's the, the, the part of a bread recipe that rises. It causes it to rise. You only need a tiny bit of it. 
and it goes a long way. A little goes a long way when it comes to leaven. Some of you have discovered this in your early bakery express experiments. When I was a, a student about 20 years ago, I used to... Uh, my, basically, I lived in a flat with a bunch of guys, and they dreaded the night when it was Joel's cooking night. <laughs> because I had this kind of weird kind of pattern. I, couldn't, I could not end this weird instinct I had to always think, I think that pizza base needs a bit more baking powder. Because I couldn't trust the recipe, as it said in my little cookbook. Put so much baking powder in, and I'd be like, mm, that's not enough. My instinct was, it's not enough. That's, not, that's nowhere near enough. That's, that's pathetic, it's tiny. Look at all this flour, look at all this whatever else you put in. I can't remember. The dough. And, and, and yeah, I haven't made it since. I've been put off. So, so I threw in a bit of baking powder. That's not going to do anything. Put in a bit more. Maybe just a little bit more. Okay, okay. But, and, and, you know, every, every time, you know, whenever it was, the, basically the oven was just out of action for a month because, because all, you get this oven where you're like pulling out, you know, take the strength of Hercules to pull this pizza out. It wasn't really a pizza, it was just a huge loaf of bread with tomato puree and cheese sticking to the roof of the oven and uh, a bit of you know, pepperami and herbs. And, and I'd pull it out, and it's like, why, why did I not learn? Next month, I'd think, well, I won't do that again. I'll put in the right amount this time. But of course, I didn't, because my instinct tended to prevail, sadly. And we ended up with a mess. Because a little bit of yeast goes a long way. You only need a tiny bit of leaven to get right through the dough. Jesus is saying to the disciples, you only need a little bit of that Sadducee, Pharisee attitude, and you'll be poisoned. You'll be blinded. You'll miss the whole point. And it's worth just deconstructing for a second. Why is it the Sadducees and the Pharisees, why, why does the Bible make the point that of who was there? Who were these opponents? It's very instructive. First of all, because the Sadducees and the Pharisees were not mates. They were, they were bitter opponents. Okay, I'm not saying they had like the you know, Sadducee on their leather jacket back and Pharisee. It wasn't like you know, New York slum gangs, but, but they were definitely not big fans of each other. And yet Jesus somehow brings them together. <laughs> How Jesus brings people together is fascinating. Sometimes it's just by sheer opposition. We hate this guy more than we hate each other, so we're going to be on each other's sides. They turn up, they start to oppose Jesus, the Pharisees and Sadducees, but you have to think, what is it that made them distinct? Well, putting it really simply for time, the Pharisees were the hardcore religious guys. The Sadducees were rather more compromised. They were in with the elites. They were, they were rather secular people. So the Sadducees would have been seen as kind of lightweights, spiritually speaking. Pharisees would have frowned on them because they wouldn't have believed the whole Bible. They, they wouldn't have taken a lot of spiritual things very seriously. They didn't even believe the resurrection, it was told, the, 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 the hope of the future resurrection. They didn't believe that. They were kind of, well, this life is all that matters. This life is all that counts. We're Sadducees. We're kind of secular. We're kind of sophisticated. We're kind of worldly. We're in with Herod. We're even kind of in with the Romans. <sighs> Ooh, nasty. If you're a Pharisee, that stinks. Because these Pharisees are like hardcore. They don't compromise. No, no, we take this book. We take the Bible. We take the law. We, we obey the law. We are Israel. We are the true Israel. We are the true, pure people of God. We are the pure, religious, pure, 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 pure people. So there's this violent opposition between the two. They didn't trust each other. Jesus says, be careful of both of them. That's interesting. He doesn't say, well, if you push me to the wall, I'm more of a Pharisee than a Sadducee. I'm kind of on their side, really. I'm kind of more right-wing than left-wing. I'm kind of more left-wing than right-wing. I'm kind of in with these, ah, that's me. Well, you know, Jesus, he's harder pushing into a corner. He's basically saying, be careful of both. Why? I would have thought he'd be more of a Pharisee, wouldn't he? Jesus took the Bible seriously, and he, that he did. <laughs> But he wasn't a Pharisee. He, he was opposed to the Pharisees, and it was the Pharisees that had the big trouble with him. Jesus wasn't going to settle on, on, on falling into either camp. He says, look, guys, there are basically two ways to avoid God. That's what he's saying. He said there's two ways. You can do it as a Pharisee, you can do it as a Sadducee. Sadducee is probably the more obvious way to avoid God. You say, ha, this book outmoded, out of date, irrelevant, not for me. I'm going to live a secular life. I'm going to go and live in Brighton in the 21st century, and I'm going to just party my life through. I'm going to live a, a godless life because that's the way to live. I don't want God in my life. He ruins my fun. 
He ruins my pleasure. I desire to enjoy my life. God threatens that desire. I will be a Sadducee. That's what many people do. That's what many of us do instinctively. We're inclined away from God, and the way we avoid him is by simply running into secular lifestyle, into a godless lifestyle. And we pursue whatever the Bible says about sex and sexuality, whatever the Bible says about drunkenness, whatever the Bible says about responsibility to the poor, whatever the Bible says about church and being in community and, 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 and honest with each other, we ignore all that because that's not for us because we want to simply enjoy our life. That's the Sadducee. Now, be careful because the Pharisees amongst us are thinking, yeah, we know those guys. See them off, preacher. We don't like them. Jesus is got the Pharisees just as much in his sights. Have you noticed? You might think, well, there's not many of them in Brighton, are there? <laughs> About 2% of Brighton goes to church. Not many religious people. Yeah, I'm not so sure. People are Pharisees in different ways. What I mean by a Pharisee in this point case is, is, is really someone who's basically avoiding God by being good. That's how you avoid him. You avoid him by trying to be good. By trying very hard to be so impressive you don't need him. You can do that in all kinds. You can do that by going to church. Some of you right here, that's, that's exactly how you're, you're treating God. You're at church, but you're kind of, you're not all that into God. You're, or at least you are, but you're in a kind of, the God you're here for is the one that you can keep happy. I keep pleasing him. I do enough to get by. I keep the rules, and that means that God is, is really obliged to keep his side of the contract. I do the good things. God kind of looks after me. God, God is obliged to, because I'm a good person. That's, that's how a Pharisee would tend to think. And you can think that as a classic Christian, or you can think it as even a secular Pharisee. I'm a good person because, well, I recycle, because I read the right newspaper, I have the right opinions, I say the right things on Twitter. That makes me righteous. It makes me a good person. I pay my taxes. I'm a good person. I give to charity. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I'm a tolerant person. I'm a nice person citizen. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a sophisticated citizen. I'm a good person. You're not going to get me with that everyone's a sinner stuff because I'm not. I'm a good person. It's just the same, friends. It's the Pharisee instinct. They say, I don't really need God. I'm going to avoid him by keeping up appearances and behavior. It's really just the same. Jesus says, be careful of that baking powder. <laughs> be careful of letting it spread. Because the truth is, friends, when you come to God, it's going gonna, it's gonna to knock you a bit. It's going to humble you. It's going to keep you humble. I'm, not, I'm talking to everyone. You may say, well, yeah, I, I remember that when I became a Christian in the 70s. I remember being humbled. No, no, no. You should be getting humbled every day. That's what it is to, to know him, to get close to the light. You're aware of your darkness. You're sort of, wow, I'm not what I wish I was. I'm, I'm, I'm broken. I'm in need. I'm in terrible need. Every day I wake up, I say, God, I need you and your grace and your help and your power. <sighs> if, you, if you kept record of my sins, who could stand? That's, that's the way the Bible talks. We're not aware of how good we are. We're more aware of how messed up we are, how needy we are. We spend our lives not moving beyond that place, really kind of camp out there. Stay there. It's a safer place. We don't advance either into Sadducee territory or Pharisee territory. We say, God, I want to stay close to you. I want to be honest. I want to say, I need you. I need you. Is that how you see it? You can usually tell if someone's got that attitude by the way they respond to offenses. See, God will offend you. You'll offend the things that you think are precious. You'll take the sacred cows of your life and, and slaughter them. And not just bad things. I'm not just talking about sins. I'm talking about sometimes things that are good. He'll take things that are good and he'll take them away from you. Take your reputation away sometimes. Let your honor be tarnished. He'll ask you to do things that you think, I can't do that. No one in my family has ever done that. I come from a background where no one would ever do that, and I'm not going to. God says, well, it says here. And we're offended. We're offended. 
it gets to us deep. We feel offended by the requirements, the, the things we're asked to do. We're offended by the very prospect of being numbered with the people of God. There are many people in Brighton who would say, oh, I'm a Christian, but I'm not a church person. Some of you are watching this on video because you won't come to church. Because your attitude is, yeah, I'm offended by having to be a, a Christian. I don't mind believing in Jesus, but I don't like Christians. I don't like church, because those church people, they're all hypocrites. They're all monsters. They're nothing, they're nothing like me. You're a Pharisee then. You need him as much as we do. Of course you're broken. We're all broken. You not see that? I'm a I remember someone, a friend of mine who became a Christian, in his, I guess in his early 20s, and he, he came to me a, f or a few days afterwards. He said, I feel like I've become everything I used to hate. That's, it's kind of like that when you come to Jesus. He has a way of turning everything upside down. All your preferences, all your ideas, all your evaluations. They were wrong anyway. You were going to crash the plane. You shouldn't trust just your instincts. Let him, let him rule. Let him Lead, humble yourself. Don't be so full of your attitudes and your opinions. Don't be so full of that false yeast, that bad baking powder. We can be offended by church. We can be offended even as we're in church. We can just get jaded and cynical. And have an attitude of, you know, impress me. Impress me. One of the reasons we start the year with two weeks of prayer and fasting is so that we get out of that attitude. I don't want to be in a church where we're all full of our ideas. I really don't. That's just, that's awful. That's a Pharisee, Sadducee church. You spend two weeks before God. You humble yourself. You pray. You ask him to speak and lead and direct. A little bit heavier, a little bit healthier, though. <laughs> a lot healthier. In the end, it's more joyful. We're way more aware of him that way. And he starts to speak. He starts to lead. And he starts to do things. And some of us, we can be in church life. We can fail to see what God's doing. Just like these gentlemen. They didn't see what God was doing. Pharisees and Sadducees have got no idea the Son of God's turned up. The Messiah is here. We've, our forefathers, our granddads, our great-granddads wept and fasted and prayed for this day. And it's come to us. And we're just a little bit too sophisticated for it. We're not that impressed. We've got some questions to ask. You can be like that in church. God can be doing stuff. He's even, I dare, to, I dare to say this, he's doing stuff in this church, believe it or not. He's doing some good things. When we gathered to pray and fast last year, amazing things. He spoke to us, it shaped the year. We've had remarkably encouraging things happen. We could fail to see it. We could fail to get involved. We could fail to serve. We could fail to be encouraged and encouraging. We could fail to see that the most important thing on planet Earth, the local church, is being built in our generation. We get a part to play. We fail to see it because we're too sophisticated, we're too spiritually blind. Do not make that mistake this year, friends. Gather with us, join with us, pray with us, seek God, see what God will do. Get involved in his work, in his kingdom. This is one last thing that he does here, and it kind of comes up because of the way the disciples, the 12, respond. So we've got the Pharisees and the Sadducees and their failed response. <laughs> Trying to test Jesus. Hostile, effectively, antagonistic, adversarial, and other big words. And then these disciples, the 12, they show up. Oh, well, Jesus is talking to them about the bread. He says, the leaven. Watch out, beware of the leaven. In verse 7, they began discussing among themselves, saying, we brought no bread. This is one of the comic, you know, comedy bits of the, <laughs> of the Gospels. Because it's just the classic kind of situation. You've got these kind of Laurel and Hardy guys that follow Jesus around, clearly not always knowing quite what was going on. <laughs> clearly listening to him teach and saying, oh, yes, Master, yes, yes, very good, Master. Yes, yes, very good. Very good, yes. What's he talking about? What's he talking about? <laughs> Jesus says, you beware of that yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Imagine them all going, mmm, yes, oh, yes. Nasty yeast. Horrid yeast. Trust us, Master, if any of that yeast will stamp on it, any yeast in here. And they're just missing the point. What was, what was, what was that about? Oh, he forgot the bread. He's talking about the bread. He's blaming me for forgetting the bread. Who for, whose job was it to bring the bread? We haven't brought bread again. We're in the flipping desert and there's no bread. Again! Whose fault is it? And they're just suddenly, totally thrown by this. And Jesus is kind of patiently, ah, guys, that's not what I'm talking about. He has to explain it to them. Verse 8. 
Jesus aware of this. Can you imagine how Jesus felt so often he's having to be like a math teacher. No, let's go back to the beginning and show you're working. I'm not going to give you the answer. I want you to work this one out, okay? Oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing this? This is interesting. Why are you discussing this? But he asks the question, you of little faith. This is the last thing that we need to say. Faith. The thing that Jesus was shocked by was the lack of faith. He was more shocked by that than he was by any other behavior. You see it in the way he dealt with people. You see it in the way he dealt with the disciples when they couldn't believe him. He's just cross. Where's your faith? Where's your faith? Why don't you trust? Where's your faith? But when he saw it, when he saw people actually doing the opposite and trusting and being full of faith, like that woman back in chapter 15, the Syrophoenician woman, he says to, the, he says to her, great is your faith. He's impressed with her. Your faith is amazing. And this is an outsider. She's not Jewish. She's not one of the people of God. He said it to a Roman centurion of all people, the sort of guy that everyone would have seen, Ugh, the enemy, the Roman centurion, the, the oppressor. Jesus said to him, your faith is amazing. I love your faith. Jesus is impressed with faith. He's more impressed with that than he is with belonging to the right tribe, good behavior, keeping the rules. All of that stuff is secondary. <sighs> faith. When he sees faith, he's excited. When he sees unbelief, he's, he's disappointed. Or at least he's, he's patiently having to go through it again. Guys, trust. Faith. He calls out faith. That's the third thing he does. He calls out faith from these men. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith. This is the way that we move forward. This is the way that we move in this relationship. It's faith, it's trust. And some of you, before we finish, you need to get free from this. You're thinking, okay, I get you. So what I have to do is pump up my, my faith muscles. I have to start working harder, straining harder to believe stuff, even stuff that I don't think is true. That's what we tend to think faith means. It means we believe things that we don't believe. It's mind over matter. It's believe, just believe more, believe. It becomes this kind of almost physical strain of, of, of sort of self-deception. Faith, great faith when you believe things that aren't true. Not so. That's not what faith is. When Jesus commends someone for great faith, well, you could, you could really get it down to three things really quickly. The first of the three things is that they, but they, have, they see a great God. They're more aware of the great God. And that means that there's brokenness in themselves. Brokenness. They're not impressed. Just as I was saying earlier, they're broken. They're not full of themselves. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones used to say, it's only the person who is hopeless about themselves who really learns to trust God. And that's encouraging, actually, isn't it? Maybe you're going through a season, maybe even this last Christmas, you've gone through a moment where you thought, how could I do that? What a mess I've made. I've blown it. I've failed. I've failed with sin. I've failed with my family. I've, I've, I've blown it. I'm not a good husband, father, wife, mother, child. I'm not good at anything. I'm, I'm, I'm failing. I, I'm not strong. I haven't got it in myself. How could I be a strong? Is the preacher telling me to have strong faith. I'm weak, full of unbelief. It's not the end of the story. If you're broken, there's room for faith because you're not trusting yourself. Great faith is little trust in a great God. Being more aware of him and his majesty, his greatness. That's how we get faith. Being less impressed with ourselves. Are you, are you still impressed with yourself? When we come to the table in a moment, take bread, take wine. If, if you're a Christian, we want you to come. We want you to know that you're welcome at the table, not because of how good you are. Come to receive the bread. Come to receive in faith. Trust him. He's enough for you. How do I grow in this? How do I grow in brokenness? Well, prayer and fasting will help. <laughs> Praying helps, okay? That's the second thing. Prayer. Do you, do you, do you understand the role that prayer... It, prayer means that your, your focus is on him. You're seeking him. You're effectively a bit more desperate for him. You're letting him offend you. You're letting him hit your sacred cows and touch on some sensitive areas, you're letting him do that and you're still coming back for more. You're still prayerful. You're still saying, God, it's hard, but I trust you. You've taken some things away that I love, but I trust you. I believe that you're good. I will keep seeking God. You keep seeking God, that speaks of faith. 
I put it second, not first, because some people pray and fast not from a position of brokenness, and their praying and fasting just becomes more Phariseeism. You notch up your score as a praying person. I prayed more than she does, so I'm a better prayer. Wrong. You start with brokenness. Come to prayer from that place of need. Don't be impressed with yourself as a prayer warrior. And then third and finally, remembrance. You remember what he's done. Jesus says, no sign will be given to this generation, but the sign of Jonah. It's a crazy verse. What does that mean? Do you remember that verse we read? What's he saying? He's saying there's a sign that I'm going to give. It's the sign of someone going down into the deep and rising again. That's the sign. That's the great sign. All the other signs, free meals, healings, exorcisms, blind seeing, all of it, they really point to the one great sign. The one great sign is that Jesus went down into death for us and rose again. If we believe that, if we hold to it, we trust it, our faith will grow. Our confidence in him will grow. We'll handle the battles. We'll handle the moments where, who brought the bread? We're in trouble. We panic. No, 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 no. We don't need to because we have a master, a savior who went down into death for us. He took on death for us. He can take on a, the lack of bread. He can look after us in every moment of 2016. He can see us through because he's faithful and we remember that. That's what we do when we come to the table. Remembrance. Remember what he's done. Hold tight to it. Take it into your life. Take it into your body. Receive the grace, the goodness, the kindness of God given to us in his son Jesus. The greatest sign is the cross and resurrection.